Live from New York, it's theCUBE. Covering Micron Summit 2017, brought to you by Micron. Welcome back to New York City, everybody. This is theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. And we've got wall-to-wall -wall coverage of Micron Summit. We saw announcements of NVMe, NVMe of a fabric. Uh, some great presentations from uh, industry analysts like uh, Laura Dubois, some practitioners, CIOs, and so forth. Steve Pawlowski is here. He's the Vice President of Advanced Computing Solutions and he's, uh, at Micron. He's joined by Tom Eby, who's the Vice President of Compute and Networking Business at Micron. Gents, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Great to be here, great thanks. Be here. Steve, you are presenting today, mm -hmm. and I got, I got to start off. So I've, I've asked this question of Pat Gelsinger, and he got very defensive as a former Intel guy, but so I'll ask you to, he said, Pat, is Moore's law attenuating? And he said, well, I won't tell you what Pat's answer was, but I got to ask you, I mean, we, we see it in <clears throat> the comments that you guys make you know, to Wall Street, but is it really, or, or how should we think about Moore's law? Well I, well, I probably won't get as defensive, but you know, when you spend 32 <laughs> years defending something, it's, it's hard to you know, make a comment to the, to, the, to the opposite. I think the most important thing is, it's really, there are two elements that, that there's Moore's Law, which is just all about doubling the number of transistors. And, you know, even with seven, you know, 16 nanometer, 14 nanometer, 10, 7, there's still that doubling is going to happen for the next two or three process generations. So the doubling will continue. The big issue is Denard scaling. So Denard scaling was after, a, uh, I believe he was an IBM fellow, and he observed that as you scale in terms of transistors, because there was such an impact in terms of the turn on voltage of the transistor to the supply, that you saw a benefit in speed and a benefit in power. In about 2006, Denard scaling start, we started to see that that wasn't happening. We were hitting a power wall and a power limit. So I wouldn't say Moore's Law has come to an end, but Denard scaling has come to an end. Mm -hmm. So it's causing us to rethink how we build our systems because we just can't keep up with the performance requirements. And, and you know, to Pat's point, uh, Pat's like the greatest. I used to work for Pat, so I know exactly. He, he's the greatest all-time Q guest and is no, number one. I really, I'm hoping to unseat him. So, okay, well, you, need, <laughs> you need about like 15, 20 more interviews. Yeah. He's a, he's a, he's oh, a it's the quantity, not quality. Yeah, okay, okay. Oh, it's both. <laughs> and, and he has the longest interview, John Furrier. Uh, my business partner and co-host, he can talk a lot. And at one point, he just said, "Pat, I give up." Uh, yeah. He, he you know, talked to us. Yeah. But his point was that we've marched to the cadence of Moore's law in terms of where the innovation has come from in this industry, you know, for decades. But, but Tom, the the innovation is now coming from other places. It's the combination of other factors, and that's a big part of what you guys are announcing today, right? Sure, sure. I, you know, I think uh, you know one of the things that you see is uh, you know traditionally. Um, it was a fairly uh, you know, homogeneous set of workloads um, that were getting driven out of the data center, right? Um, and it was you know, mainstream DRAM, mainstream processors. And you're seeing just an increasingly uh, heterogeneous set of problems uh, that people are trying to solve. And along with that, um, a more uh, complex and rich set of solutions to go after those problems. Uh, you know, just a couple you know, very common examples if you look at how people are doing machine learning training. Uh, very often that is done with a, you know, with a GPU that's getting fed by a graphics memory. Uh, if you look at how people are doing uh, machine learning classification, uh, often that's an FPGA, um, in many cases fed by, uh, you know, by hybrid memory cube. And so this uh, increasing specialization of workloads and solutions to support those workloads um, and uh, specialized memories to support that uh, are just an opportunity for, uh, you know, for more value add for, uh, for memory companies like Micron. So Steve, we, when we have folks like you guys on, we like to talk about you know, what's changing. And you may gave a stat today about the thousand to one ratio of, of the efficiency of you know, moving data versus com compute. Yeah. And what are the implications that that ha has uh, on applications, IT in general, and, and how do you re-architect IT <clears throat> to solve that problem? Well, so first, it's, it's hard to re-architect actually the, the, the computing architecture because there's billions of dollars worth of legacy software out there that you still need to run. But one of the big things we can do is, um, um, and you know, this is what we're doing at Micron, is if the data is critical, it stays resident and you move computing to the data. So you try to move as much of what you can do in terms of processing that data closer to the data so you're not you know, sending that all the way over. Because in a lot of cases, the processors, 
Most of them are increment operations, so it'll take a big chunk of data, add one, and send it back. And that's just a tremendous waste of time and energy, and you can do a lot of that work closer and closer to memory. Eventually, can you get a core in, you know, close to memory, you know, in memory? Uh, I believe so. It won't run at several gigahertz, but you can get that kind of capability in memory and do a lot more of that functionality. And if you can leverage the legacy software, it can take advantage of that and then over time start to build on top of that with new applications. The industry will start to move. And that's, you know, I mentioned the two summer Olympic cycle. It takes, when you come up with a, one of the reasons why I believe Intel was so successful was um, like with the 386, it didn't have any 32-bit software and it was a 32-bit architecture, but it ran 16-bit code very well. And so as you start to add new features and new capabilities, as long as you can run that legacy code and people see an impact, they'll buy, the hardware will become more pervasive and then the software ecosystem will start to follow. Mm. So a, a, a question on where, where new uh, systems are going, um, because clearly this fabric changes an awful lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of other things going on as well. There's PCI Gen 4 that's coming along. There's, as you said, GPUs, there's FPGAs. Um, there's a lot of uh, stuff in there that you can if make more efficient uh, in that way. And one of, the one, one of the areas that is certainly looks very interesting to me is things like NVLink, which can allow you uh, um, uh, a way of sharing data uh, well, sending data once or sharing that data across multiple different uh, CPUs or, or the similar CAPI link. Um, so w with this host of different pieces in that architecture, how are you seeing um, uh, the um, NVMe over Fabric fitting into all those different pieces? Well, how are people going to put these together? Do you want to take that? Or? I'll let you take a step at it. Okay. <laughs> well, <coughs> You know, most of these, uh, most of the architecture, I mean, NVLink is a proprietary architecture. It's a great architecture, by the way, and um, with people that know how to do really high-speed links. You know, in NVIDIA is one of the best at it. Um, but a lot of these architectures, like PCI and like, um, um, you know, some of the others that are coming up, they have a lot of legacy baggage, and so you're still having to contain, continue right. with right. either the software paradigm or whatnot. I actually do see, so NVMe over Fabric is a good step, but I actually see that at some point in time there will be an abstracted interface that will become the network interface. And whether that becomes some variant of NVLink, uh, OpenCAPI, CCIX, Gen Z, you know, that becomes the next abstracted interface, but it has to have networking capabilities because if what we are planning to do as actually comes to fruition, that you will have the compute memory subsystem there and the only connection between these components will be through a fabric. And when you want it to be a switchless fabric inside the, inside the rack and then outside the rack, you want to go to a top of rack switch, but you want to make it as low a latency as possible to the other elements that it's going to connect to. Tom, I wonder if we could talk about some of the broader trends in the server and, and networking space, how they're affecting your business. So obviously, you've got the hyperscale guys. Yep. Um, you've got certainly consolidation in, in the server market in terms of the number of players. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, Dell buying EMC, another interesting sort of piece of the consolidation. On the networking side, we're pushing bottlenecks, you know, to the to the networks. Uh, yep. Things, traffic's going east-west versus north-south. Still, yep. Cisco's a dominant player, but you see others, yep. whether it's software-defined or folks like Arista really taking, you know, a stab at, uh, at, at, at the leader. What do you see in that those businesses, and, and how is it affecting your business? Sure. Well, let me, let me take two. One is just you know kind of growth in the scale of the data center opportunity, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we see um, you know the, uh, the the cloud or hyperscale providers complementing um, you know the traditional uh, still very strong OEM server partnerships that we have. Uh, you know from a you know from a scale perspective, obviously you heard you know Darren and others earlier today uh, talking about a lot of uh, of the factors uh, that are driving uh, you know data scale growth, be that public, private, uh, hybrid cloud. Uh, from you know video capture and distribution uh, that's you know upsetting the TV industry as we once knew it uh, to the support for the myriad of, uh, of IoT devices that are out there um, you know through the opportunity to monetize data whether that's um, you know consumer facing public data or um, uh, you know uh, industrial data uh, that has never been digitized before. And, and so all of that is you know is what's behind the fact that um, you know you go back three years ago, and the PC was the largest consumer of, of DRAM bits, not only within, uh, within our business, but for the company. 
uh, you know, mobile passed that in 2015. Uh, now the data center as a whole is larger than that. Um, and if you look out to the end of the decade, uh, the cloud and enterprise each individually will be larger than PC. So it's a, it's a fairly fundamental shift in terms of the, the volume that's driving our business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think back to the question of, of uh, kind of the, the complementary nature of, uh, you know, the traditional server OEMs and the, uh, um, you know, and the, uh, and the hyperscaler cloud providers. Um, again, I, I'd mentioned, you know, both of them are seeing that ever increasing uh, complexity and heterogeneity of workloads and our opportunities to get in and understand how, um, you know, differentiated solutions can support those better um, is just a great opportunity for, you know, for a, for a memory provider to, uh, to, to add value. And that's true across both of those classes of players. Um, if there's one thing I think that, that we're, we're seeing from, uh, you know, from the, the hyperscale players, they tend to be able to have a more controlled set of workloads and a more controlled operating environment. Uh, which can tend to make their validation problem a little bit simpler and more straightforward. And so when, when there are new technologies that come in, uh, to the extent that they can validate those a little bit quicker, uh, they can adopt them faster, and so can perhaps be a little bit uh, earlier adopter on that, on that curve. Right. right. Steve, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about this influx of data and the implications for s systems and, and memory architecture. I mean, it goes, it goes back to you know, the mainframe days of, of, of MVSXA and expanded memory, and we were thinking about, okay, w how do we persist beyond this you know, limited resource? Didn't have nearly the data you know, volumes that, that we do today. Uh, and then you mentioned Fusion I.O. in your, your remarks. We were kind of David Flynn groupies back in the day and the whole <laughs> idea of atomic rights and eliminating you know, SCSI. Um, so what are you seeing in terms of, of, of architectures changing to accommodate this, this exponential <coughs> data growth? Well, um, so I think, there, well, there's really a couple things. Um, you know, we t when we talk about, hey, we're going to have all this data and where are we going to store it? Um, you know, a, a petabyte of data or an exabyte of data, so you know, Darren talked about zettabytes of data. An exabyte of data in flash is roughly about $172 million if you look at the current cost per gigabit equivalent. So I'm not really sure you can store all that data. What you're gonna have to do is find the data that's relevant. For example, if you're taking a picture of a image and that image is the same 24 hours of the day, but when a cat moves through, you wanna see what changes. That's the kind of information you really wanna change. So I think what's going to happen is there's a tremendous amount of data being generated, but there's going to have to be a lot of filtering or action at the edge to decide what data to keep and what data not to keep. And I think that's where a lot of the big innovation is going to occur because you just don't have the backbone. 5G spec, you know, 5G uh, implementations will certainly add a lot in terms of a more robust, reliable cellular capability, but it's still not going to be able to provide the kind of backhaul you need if you're just sending raw data to the data center. There has to be significant amount of intelligence out at the edge. And that's where energy efficiency comes into play because not everybody has a power cord they can plug into. So you know, the, the, the thinking of how this architecture is going to evolve is going to be huge. But it all has to revolve around what data do you keep, what data do you throw away. So it's either going to be disposed of at the edge or maybe maybe persisted at, at the edge, but it's certainly not going to be shipped all back to the centralized right. cloud. It's kind of kind of like the JPEG or MPEG. You know, MPEG keeps a frame and then they keep data on terms of how that frame changes so they don't continue to to maintain data on every frame. It's just how those frames happen to change so that that's how they can get the compression ratios that they're looking for. I think we're just going to have to apply that kind of capability across the broader spectrum. But what that means is you're going to have to have storage out there enough to keep the data and then be able to have the compute at the edge enough of it to be able to say what's relevant and what's not. And those algorithms have to change constantly. Right. So, I mean, that's a very interesting area of the, the edge. Uh, the amount of compute that we're going to be pushing out to the edge yep. is in the opposite direction to currently where everything is going towards the cloud. That seems to be uh, a very strong uh, move uh, and, and a, nece a necessary move to actually be able to uh, then bring the, 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 the nuggets it is. back up it is. to but, the top. But you know, I don't think we're going to be pushing 64-bit double precision arithmetic out to the edge. <laughs> I think we're going to make it as simplistic as possible to do whatever work actually makes sense. Right. Yeah. Do, do you see um, uh, the devices at the edge, though, it's starting to put a lot of this processing uh, in, for example, a camera, putting it into the camera itself, and uh, those architectures <coughs> being changed quite dramatically to, to be able to solve some of these 
uh, data reduction problems as early as you possibly can. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think mm -hmm. um, I, again, I think there's 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 uh, there's one factor which Steve's already covered very well, which is simply the the raw bandwidth will not be there uh, to bring everything back into. Uh, you know, a, a centralized location, no matter how, how many data centers you build out around the world. Uh, but I think the other factor, uh, which won't impact all applications, but a bunch of ones that matter, is going to be latency. Um, right. You know, which is you have a you know an advanced uh, you know driver automation system in a car, yeah. um, and you know you need to be making real time decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and and so I think the combination of those two is uh, is going to continue to be a, a driving force towards that uh, that intelligence you know at the edge. Um, at the same time, I don't think no matter how phenomenal a job we do at that edge processing, filtering, compression, call it what you will, um, that we're going to see a uh, material drop in the demand uh, sure. for both no, memory and sure. storage, you know, sitting central in the sitting the centrally. Right. Yeah. I, I think it's I think it's going to barely keep up, uh, right, um, as we push that that uh, that processing to the edge. <laughs> I totally agree. I totally agree. Yeah, that know, wasn't implying that uh, yeah. you no. get rid yeah. of the cloud. Yeah. It was right. just that. What? On top of it, you're going to have to push a huge amount of computing on it. Right. And, well, and uh, I was just wondering, is that going to be a separate type of product, or are you going to take the, your architecture and adapt it to different spaces? Um, you know, I, I think it's again, it's going to be uh, increasingly as as volumes grow, it'll it'll be increasingly specialized. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I think that um, you know, so you want to put. Um, uh, you know, intelligent agent functionality into a smartphone. Um, you know, the requirements of that and the ability to perhaps over time have a more hybrid solution uh, where, you know, you're perhaps knocking off the easy bits of that problem, you know, in the handset and, and sending the tougher ones back, uh, you know, back, uh, you know, more centralized works. Uh, again, to use the automotive example, um, you know, anything that's real time, I'm pretty sure the drivers, at least in uh, in the USA, with with our legal system, are going to want that. You know, <laughs> that locally. <laughs> exactly. Do you have a point, Steve? Yeah. You want to? No, I, I completely agree. I think you know because with the stuff that we would actually put in the devices out at the edge will actually add area and cost that the people in the data center may say, "I'm not paying for that." And if you give it to them for free, you end up giving, and you don't make any money. So I think they will be more specialized. Mm -hmm. You know, specialized. But you know, one of the epiphanies I had coming to Micron was just how much we could actually do in the memory array. You, know, oh, you mentioned I, key value yeah, store. Yeah, key value yeah. store is a perfect yeah. example yeah. in doing machine learning classification. I can actually see building, you know, combo, you know, deep neural nets out of these devices because we will have the capability. Training will occur somewhere else, mm -hmm. but once we've yeah. got those right. trained weights, we can actually run those devices, you know, yeah. pretty well. Excellent. So. All right, we got to leave it there, gents. Thanks for coming on the cube. Really Thank appreciate you. your. Hey, thanks for having us. You're thanks welcome. Okay. Us. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back to wrap up after this short break. This is the cube. We're live from Micron Summit in New York City. Be right back. Robert Hershevik. People obviously know.